Welcome to the One Health Seminar Series officially. This series is organized by the University of Guelph One Health Institute and graduate students enrolled in the One Health Collaborative Specialization. My name is Sydney Pierce and I'm a PhD student in the Department okay. of Population Medicine and that is Siri again. <laughs> and also one of the One Health students. It is my pleasure to be facilitating this seminar today. Currently, I'm residing near the University of Guelph, and with great respect, we acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandaran people and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We uphold the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which highlights how we all share and hold responsibility for the care of the land we reside on, as well as uphold the significance of the continuing relationship our Indigenous neighbours have with this land. We recognize that this gathering place and all the places we are joining from today is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging them reminds us of our relationship to this land where we explore, share, discuss, and learn, and our shared responsibility for human, animal, and environmental health. I encourage all of you to research, learn, and reflect upon the historical and current state of the land you reside on today as you move on from this seminar. Now, before I introduce our speaker, um, who is graciously still with, with us, thank you. Um, I wish to inform you that we are recording this seminar. The recording will be posted on the One Health YouTube channel and a link will be made available on the One Health Institute website. The recording may also be used by the One Health Institute in the context of promoting and showcasing One Health work being done on our campus. If you have any questions or concerns about the recording or One Health generally, please contact us at onehealth at uoguelph.ca. In addition, we enabled live captions for this presentation. If you wish to see the captions, please click on the settings options at the bottom right of your screen and click the English option. At the end of the seminar presentation, you will be able to ask questions. This is no longer a Microsoft Teams live event, so you can either raise your hand, which is a different function from the live event Q&A, unfortunately, but you can raise your hand. Um, the hand icon is next to the speech bubble icon on the right of it and also on the left of the dot 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 settings icon. Um, so you can click that and then unmute yourself or share questions in the chat which functions relatively similar to Teams Live. You will see those questions um, as they pop up and our myself will I'll read them out to the to the speaker as we go through. So to ensure um, yeah, so to ensure that everyone is comfortable, you can try adding your department to that chat function again right now if you'd like. We did receive that in the last portion or in the Teams Live event, so it's okay if you don't want to again. So moving on from that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Jennifer Proventure is a research, assist, a research scientist in the Exotoxical, or Ecotoxicology and Wildlife Health Division of the Science and Technology Branch of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Her work focuses on issues affecting the conservation of wildlife species with partners and is primarily focused on Arctic ecosystems, although her current work takes place across Canada. She has worked in Northern Canada since 2007 when she became involved in Arctic research during the last international polar year. Her work currently focuses on projects with partners that aim to increase our understanding of how diseases and contaminants can affect wildlife with a focus on migratory birds and plastic pollution. And today she will speak she will be speaking to us about plastic pollution and wildlife health. So please take it away, Doctor. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, thanks again for everyone sticking around to that technical difficulties. It's the, um, you know, challenge of the day, um, but I'm glad that we are all able to be here and chat uh, today. So I do a presentation. I'm going to move through maybe some of the slides a little bit faster than I would have anticipated, but that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see questions and feel free to um, put them into the chat box as we go. I would like you to locate that chat box and test it out. There is going to be some, uh, you know, listening questions as we go. Uh, so you will need to locate that chat box to answer some answers. So just really quickly, my name is Jennifer Provence. I'm a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. And so I work on wildlife health issues. And so that includes things like plastic pollution, pathogens, die off. 
uh, contaminants like you can see in the top row. Um, you see the bird oiled, the die off on the beach and the bird with the plastic ingestion. Uh, I also work on kind of larger macro plastic. So entanglement, I do some work on some fisheries entanglement and plastic. And then not directly, but my group certainly works on the harvest of, of birds. And so all of these things that kind of can affect wildlife and migratory bird populations. So we're going to focus on plastic pollution today, but you'll see there's a little bit of cross overlap between some of these issues. So the first thing I want to say is that uh, size matters in the world of plastic. We are talking about, you know, really big macro and mega plastics all the way down to small plastic all the way down to nanoplastics, uh, which are very tiny and by definition can cross the cell, the cell membrane. Um, most of my work focuses on the meso and microplastics, so that, that part right in the middle. And, and the definitions of those can differ depending on kind of who and where you are. Um, but it's, it's kind of in that five centimeter, and, or sorry, five millimeter and under range where most of my work occurs. I'm going to talk about three different themes today, and these are the themes that shape my research program in general in relation to plastic pollution. So we've got ingestion, uh, plastics as a vector, sorry, wildlife as a vector for plastics, and of course, plastics as a vector for contaminants. So I'm going to try to touch upon each of these three themes. So I'm going to start with ingestion and accumulation of plastics. And kind of just give a little bit of a background for those of you who maybe haven't thought about plastics very much or read a lot about plastics. So plastic pollution, debris, litter, all of these terms are kind of used interchangeably. interchangeably. Um, but debris in seabirds generally, things that are not prey or anthropogenic litter, have actually been reported in seabirds uh, dating to the you know the 1800s and so this is actually a publication on a Wilson storm petrol and they found the, the nub of a candlestick inside the gut of this small bird so you can see this is one of the species that we have where they're very light and they kind of walk along the tips of the water they just kind of dance on the wind and so you can imagine how anything that's floating you know at the surface these these birds are going to be picking up so literary ingestion by birds and wildlife in general is, is a rather old problem. It's not, it's not an emergent problem. Uh, it's really the plastic side of it that really has come to the forefront in the last couple of years. And these are pictures brought by Chris Jordan uh, in, in the Hawaiian island chain. And these are lace and albatross chicks. And Chris has done an amazing job of, of documenting and publishing these photos that show essentially lace and albatross chicks who have been fed so much plastic by their parents on this island where they're born that they they feel full and so they're, they're full and malnourished at the same time so they they actually never develop uh, along and, and fledge from the colony or leave from the colony and they they die in the colony and then their carcasses you know decompose and and their stomachs of plastics are exposed uh, and so this is a this is what most people think about when they think about seabirds and plastic ingestion. But this is one of the most, if not the most, extreme cases of this particular phenomenon. But of course, it is very visually stunning. Plastic pollution in the ocean again has has kind of occurred for a long time. This is not something new. And there's actually a, um, an amazing study led by Charles Ebsmeyer that tracked these rubber duckies that went over the side of a, uh, a cargo ship as it was leaving Hong Kong and transiting to Tacoma in 92. And the, the short story is, is that these ducks were very specific and they didn't have a hole and they were very recognizable from other pollution. And so Charles Ebsmeyer actually um, tracked these rubber ducks as they floated around the oceans and the, they, they showed up for years and, and decade and decade after the the spill and so it really tells us a lot about ocean currents and at the time it was it was really remarkable remarkable new information about ocean currents but of course with the plastics lens it also tells us a lot about how, how persistent these plastics intact can actually be that they are recognizable to a, a particular source in time and this is not something that has ceased to assist um, occur. Uh, large scale spills happen all the time. This is just one of the most recent examples uh, in a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, a large container ship um, 
you know, it was caught in a storm off of off Germany, 300 containers went over. And in one of them was a, this package of My Little Ponies or shipments of My Little Ponies. And now this beach litter across the, the landscape, particularly in the North Sea off of the Netherlands and Germany, are, are very much flooded with these very particular, you know, items from those shipping containers. And so this is actually a picture um, that a, a colleague of a colleague took as they were surveying the beach litter. So it was Ikea furniture and then these two characters from My Little Pony, which is now covering several beaches in the North Sea. So uh, we've kind of looked at this over time, and this is a review that we did with a large, a large group. And we published this in 2017, but the idea is we want to look at how far back does the, does the, the literature on plastic ingestion go in birds, but also mammals, turtles, and fish. And you can see from this graph that seabirds, for the most part, are the dominant uh, group. Um, in the kind of the review or wildlife ingestion um, literature. Fish, although taxonomically much more numerical, are very small, but I would say that this is rapidly changing over, over time. And so we'll see a lot more fish literature when these, these graphs are updated, which uh, colleagues of mine are doing. Uh, and so we've, we've seen a real explosion in some of this in some of this litter, but it does still form uh, seabirds is kind of our, our group that we know the most about. And just as a little bit of a primer, marine plastic or debris is not all the same. So we actually have two types. We have industrial plastic. So plastic is actually a, a, you know, um, a fossil fuel uh, source. And so there's the oil, natural gas that comes off the, off the you know, out of the, uh, sorry, out of the wells. It gets partitioned into a whole bunch of different things. A portion of that gets partitioned off to be plastic and it gets formed into these industrial pellets or nurdles. And we, we do find these on beaches worldwide. Uh, and then it's actually these pellets that get shipped to plastic factories all over the world. They get formed into different shapes and sizes. This is what we call consumer plastic or user plastic. Both of these enter the ocean and it's been estimated by the Environmental Protection Agency in the US that about 20 billion pounds of plastics enter the ocean each year. And of course, it makes its way into wildlife, it breaks down in the environment, et cetera. Uh, it has been estimated that that's about a dump truck of plastics entering the ocean every minute. So we just have started talking about eight or nine uh, dump trucks that just have like backed up, you know, effectively. Uh, and put that material into the ocean. And so this is, is ongoing. Of course, there's huge efforts to reduce this, but it is uh, an, an ongoing problem. In general, um, there's been you know, several reports that have looked at this, but we're talking about hundreds of species that kind of interact with plastic, which include entanglement. And then uh, over 200 species have shown to be have ingested plastic. A lot of those are seabirds because that's where a lot of the species, sorry, the work has been done to date. But again, as, as people look in more and more species, the more and more this number continues to go up. Now, the northern fulmar is, is kind of the species I'm going to focus on for a little bit. And it's actually the species, the only species that is identified uh, of, of all species, including other, you know, fish and birds and mammals. The northern fulmar is a bird and it's, it's this only species that has been identified for a plastic indicator status. And this actually uh, took place under um, the North Sea and then there's a series of acts here. And so it is part of legislation. It's not just kind of um, the biologists kind of saying that this is the best one, but it, is, it has been incorporated into, into legislation and spe specifically OSPAR, which is the Oslo and Paris Convention. And so this is the part of the world it, it, it um, you know, exists in, in in terms of these regulatory features. Uh, and so the North Sea is where a lot of the FOMAR monitoring has taken place to date. And it's very specific, and this is a really wordy slide, but I think it's really important to share because it's very specifically laid out in the OSPAR convention. It names and I'm just going to take a second to read it just because I think it's important to have all those numbers. You know, there should be less than 10% of northern fulmars having 0.1 gram or more in their stomach and samples of 50 to 100 beach fulmars for each of the five different areas over the North Sea over a period of five years. So there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot going on. But the point is it's very specific, laid out 
in the legislation. Uh, and so this is the type of information that when policymakers or indicators are kind of looking for this material, for this type of information, that they're really trying to boil boil it down to. So it's giving you sample sizes, it's giving you locations, it's giving you proportions, it's giving like a, a year of running tally. So it's, it's very specific. And a lot of work has been done under this program. And uh, because we have a lot of data from this region, they've actually done a fairly good job of kind of creating um, communication materials. And so, you know, this is just an example. So 93% of the fulmars have plastic in their stomach. You know, on average, they have 24 pieces. And this is the essential of having a lunchbox full of plastic in a human stomach. Because, of course, it's, it's you know, northern fulmars are not a very common bird. So it's sometimes hard to understand how that relates to you. Uh, but it, it would basically be like having a lunchbox of plastic in your stomach. And over time, they've seen, they've seen you know, changes in the plastic ingestion over time. So in the 80s, they saw that the plastic was almost predominantly, or sorry, it was dominated by industrial plastic. So those, those nurdles that we talked about. Whereas in the, in the 90s, it was the user plastics that kind of really took over. And I would say the more, more recent data is that it's a little flexing in between. And so we are seeing these kind of shifts and changes over time. And that reduction in industrial pellets kind of through the 90s is really tied to some educational programs that occurred with industry um, after this data uh, came out of the region in, in the 80s. So we do have plastic ingestion, we do have fulmars in Canada, and we have plastic ingestion in these birds. Uh, and the five stars that you see on the map, this is the northern fulmar kind of range in Canada. Uh, the five stars are places where we actually have been able to um, sample fulmars over the last kind of decade or so, some more regularly, some more infrequently. Um, but certainly this is kind of something that we've been working on for the last decade and trying to figure out what this looks like in Canada. So we've got good data from the North Sea, but what do the Northern Fulmars tell us about plastic ingestion in Canada? And so we're going to talk a little bit, and this is where you need to know where your chat box is. This is where we have four samples in Canada. And so I'm going to show you three different, sorry, four different bags. And the, the job is, is that each one of these bags actually represents the human, I'm going to try to hold up so you can all, you can all see it, but the, each one of these bags represents the human equivalent or, or, or my equivalent or your equivalent of plastics that you would find in a fulmar stomach from one of these four sampling locations. And so bag, bag one that I'll, I'll show you is this bag here. So you can imagine, I'm going to stand up just so you can see it. You can imagine, so just to give you some scale, this is my stomach. One of the fulmars from this four regions has, you know, this is the human equivalent of plastic. So, so I was a fulmar being sampled from one of these locations. This is what my plastic load would look like. This is bag, bag one. That's the biggest. We kind of have the next... The next bag is this one. It's like a medium sized bag. So one of the, the fulmars has this version of it. This is bag two. And then of course it's a little bit less is bag, bag three. And then we have our smallest bag, which is bag four. And it has um, you know, much lower levels of plastic. And so what I would like you to do is take a moment. So these are our, our four bags. I'll show them up again. But I want you to type in your in your type box, in your chat box, which one of these sites, so Vancouver Island, Prince Leopold Island, Labrador Sea, Sable Island, corresponds to bags one, two, three, four. With one being your kind of largest bag, right? That's the largest bag. Two. Right, this is our, 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 our second largest bag. Three and four. And what I want you to do is type into your chat box, you know, where you think they'll go. Vancouver Island could be one, two, three, four. Prince Leopold Island could be one, two, three, four. Labdor Sea, one, two, three, four, et cetera. So I'm going to take a second and let you all uh, start typing in there. So we're starting to see some answers come through.
So we've got quite a few Vancouver Islands as, as number one. We've got a Prince Leopold Island as a number one. We've got Sable as one in a few places. So I, I want you to keep entering in those, those guesses. So I'm going to tell you that I haven't seen any completely correct answers yet. Um, but something to think about is that we, I do this a lot. We actually have more. We do this at the circumpolar level. And there's about 12 bags that students have to kind of put down on the map and, and understand the levels. Uh, and almost everyone I've done this with, except for very few exceptions, have, have kind of not gotten the right answer, uh, including including Minister McKenna, who used to be the um, ECCC minister. We I've done this exercise with her, and, and she's certainly someone who is, you know, informed on this topic, very enthusiastic, and she didn't get it right either. So you don't have to feel bad if you if you don't get it right. Lots of people who know a lot about the subject is, have, don't always get it right. So just in a uh, matter of our kind of in the time, what we'll do is just keep moving. So this is our biggest one. Most people said that this belonged to Vancouver, a few Sable and a few Prince Sable Island. This one is Sable Island. So we had number one is Sable Island as the highest amount of plastics. And it's the heaviest. It had the most plastics by mass which is um, important to kind of think about. We, we do measure mostly by mass, uh, again, in that ec the, uh, ecological quality objective. Um, so if you had Sable Island as, as number one, you are right. The next heaviest one is Vancouver. And so what's interesting is that by, by mass, Vancouver comes in number two, but it actually has the most pieces. And so the pieces are often very, very tiny in on, on kind of the BC birds, but they, so there's lots of them, but they don't have as much mass. Labrador Sea is our, our intermediate one, and then actually Prince Leopold Island is our smallest one. And so there are kind of thoughts that sometimes Prince Leopold Island can be, we actually find that it's, it's some of our lowest. And so we think that probably Sable Island is it's the highest because the birds are on Sable Island, and just for you, Sable Island's a very small island off of here, um, and so it's very close to the Atlantic Gyre. So the Atlantic Gyre is sitting at here. So the birds are kind of foraging in this area, are having access to that uh, Atlantic Gyre. Whereas the Pacific Gyre is actually a little bit more offshore. It's out here. So birds. Birds that are kind of in this area will have some overlap with the Pacific Gyre of plastic, but not a huge amount. And so it's, 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 it's a combination of kind of where the birds are and where the, where the gyres are, um, or the litter patches are. And so we see this trend, um, this latitudinal trend in kind of every coastline we've looked in. So as we go from north to south here in the western North Atlantic, again, north to south, this is on the European side of the Atlantic, and then we have north to south in the Pacific. Um, and this is, you know, work that we've kind of, it's built up over many years, but it kind of fits all the way through. Um, we get these, these north-south gradients. And you can see here's the ecological quality objective that uh, was, is set out in the North Sea. Um, and you can see that basically all of the birds, all the samples are over the ecological quality objective, except for these high Arctic fulmars. And so that's really interesting to our European colleagues because it signals that this, this level, this target, is achievable, at least in some fashion. We've also looked by um, species, because of course, you know, a seabird is not a seabird, is not a seabird. And so Florence Poon did this work in my lab where we looked at fulmars, and again, we see these really high levels, but it's not necessarily true of all these other species. And so even when they're, you know, sampled at one colony in one region, we see these really dramatic species differences. And so certainly foraging strategy or, or how animals are moving through the environment and getting food from their environments is a really important component to kind of understand the risk and exposure of plastic pollution. Now, this, this is, a, is a graph that we took from um, a paper that we did a few years ago. And, and the point is not to see all these bird species listed in here, but the idea is that we have species, you know, we have a few species that we have kind of repeated samples um, in kind of more than one location in more than one year. 
And it's only six species that we did a review. We looked at, you know, species that have some data, but not a lot. You know, we had nine species, you know, species with a, you know, a single report in a single place. We had 24. And then we had this whole whack of species in, in Canada. These are all Canadian species of seabirds uh, at 52. And of course, you know, as soon as the, the papers out, the, you know, <laughs> these counts are slightly out of date, but they haven't really changed much. And then we still really are sitting only at these six these six species where we actually have good data to either say, yes, there's, you know, either high exposure or low exposure. Uh, but a lot of species in Canada, we still have very little information about. Gulls is one that we're learning more and more about. And this is actually a, a project that Sahar Safe did in my lab a few years ago. And she looked at a species of gulls in um, in Newfoundland, and it was um, collected by colleagues of ours in Newfoundland to because the gulls are actually culled as part of the airport safety program, and so we were able to look inside these gulls. and And I think this is a really good illustration that there's certainly plastics of all type in here, but there's also metal pieces, there's paper pieces, there's string. So when we're talking about you know plastic ingestion or litter ingestion. It's often not as clean cut as kind of plastic and not plastic. It's a real mix of things specifically for some of these species. So we often do talk about debris or litter as this kind of larger, larger section. Uh, and, and frankly, the management of plastics and litter, um, you know, are very closely tied. And so we do, we do kind of think about these in this kind of holistic waste management, uh, you know, discussions. We've also looked at plastics over time, and this actually is actually two species. This is the common myrrh, and this is the thick bill myrrh, where we've actually been able to look over time. And we have samples that go back to 85, and we did a, a new study in 2012. And so you, there's a couple of different time periods here. And the real point, though, is that we have, you know, we have these mean values for plastic ingestion, and they don't really change over time. And so while we you know, generally think that plastic ingestion or plastic pollution is increasing over time, that's not actually true for all the species that we've looked at. And so this is a species that you know, has relatively low plastic ingestion historically, relatively low plastic ingestion now, you know, only 8%, um, you know, sorry, only point, there's only 0 0.08 pieces in, in the birds. And so there's not a lot of, a lot of difference. One of the things that we, you know, people often ask is about what are those, you know, okay, well, so seabirds, what about the other bird groups? So we, we do have a project with Lori Wilson, who's from CWS, and then Jesse Vermeer's lab at Carleton. And I, this is a, a slide that I like to put in. It's, it's by far not a complete slide. But the idea is, is that we do have other species, including bald eagles. And we're getting some very initial data on look, thinking about they, they actually have ingestion of glass bits, styrofoam, and other litter. And so there are, you know, certain certain species or certain groups of birds, such as, you know, bald eagles, birds of prey, that actually we have very little information about, but our initial data kind of from one bird here, one bird there, suggests that they do have high levels of plastic ingestion or litter ingestion. And this has really led to some work that we're trying to do that is thinking about more looking at a broad perspective. And so this is a graph that's a little messy, but the idea is what about those other bird groups? And so this is actually a phylogenetic plot of all the seabirds uh, globally. And this is work by Stephanie Avery Gaughan. And so what we did is a global review of birds and their plastic ingestion levels. And then we asked questions like, are they nocturnal or not? Does the species eat carrion, cephalopods, crustaceans, fish? You know, when were the studies actually done? How how big were the study sample sizes? Uh, how big are the birds? Um, what kind of age class do they burrow? Are they opportunistic feeders? All of these kind of questions that we thought might influence the plastic ingestion, and then of course their their order. And what we find is prosteliriforms, which are these black bars, um, which are albatross, petrels. Whoops. Petrels, um, full Mars, these are projected. We, we see very high levels in these birds. And when we kind of do this phylogenetic uh, analysis, we see that even for some species, you know, when we account for all the species similarities, these, these birds continue to be quite high. 
Whereas, um, you know, the penguins, which are here in red, we actually see very low levels and they're, and they're predicted to not have very low levels. And so this kind of helps us figure out what species are going to kind of have high levels and maybe which species we should be paying attention to versus, you know, some of these other groups that have very low levels are predicted to, to have low levels and perhaps we don't need to spend as much time. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is understand what individual species look like, but then how do you how do you go forward and think about this more from other species perspective as well? And a lot of the work that we've done, and, and this is um, you know not I would say the most thrilling or exciting work in terms of like publications and data, are these standardization papers. And so this is a lot of what uh, you know if you want to do global analysis and you want to kind of look at patterns over time and space. It's really these standardized methods So we've done these two with both very big author lists um, that I was able to leave through my postdoc. And it really, you know, covers sample collection, sample processing, and then the actual plastic processing and data reporting between these two. So, you know, in combination, these two basically form a guide for reporting most, you know, mostly in birds, but it's, it's, it's aimed for almost all kind of large megafauna or vertebrates. Uh, and the idea is, is that if we want to start looking at global patterns, we need to have a, a standardized methodology. And so that these two papers kind of move us towards that. On the kind of at the kind of policy level and panarctic level, this is also something that um, we've been thinking a lot more about. And, and in particular, it often gets attention at the panarctic level because there are several indigenous groups in the Arctic that consume seabirds um, as you know a part of, of part of their diet. And so we actually have work under the Arctic Council. Uh, and there are two working groups, CAF is their biodiversity working group and um, the Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative is a project and they've undertaken, a, a, or we've undertaken a project where um, a student, uh, Julia Back, did a review of plastic pollution at the pan-Arctic level in seabirds and then a postdoc, Yane Lindeberg, uh, did a review on the policies and programs again at the circumpolar Arctic perspective. Uh, and then this is kind of being incorporated by, um, you know, into a, a monitoring for and prep with partners. So, but these were kind of large efforts, and 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 it's this type of work that is actually being fed into policy at the Arctic Council. And interestingly, the Arctic Council has marine litter and plastics listed as a priority now, and it looks like moving forward, it will continue to have this listed priority. So. This is one way that the data is actually being incorporated into policy at these kind of higher levels. Uh, and, and just kind of think to think about this a little bit more, we at the Arctic Council, I work with AMAP, which is one of the one of the groups. It's the Arctic Contaminants kind of working group a little bit. And we actually have an ongoing assessment in the region. So it's the first, as far as I know, it's the first ecosystem level assessment, monitoring, prioritization of plastic pollution and litter um, to be done. And so the way that we looked at this is we looked at 11 different compartments where plastic pollution and, and marine litter uh, can, you know, can end up or transit through uh, a large guidance document of review, um, you know, was was done and we came up with seven that have um you know methods in place to be done kind of right away and then there are are a core recommendations for four that should be implemented um asap kind of thing and so you'll see that seabirds shorelines marine sediments and water are the four so these are the four that recommending be implemented as soon as possible in as many regions as possible um, to try to get some some more comprehensive assessments done again at the ecosystem level so it's not about one indicator uh, which you know because of necessity has been tried in a few regions but we're trying to get more of an ecosystem level version of it so i'm going to really quickly talk about wildlife as a as a vector for plastics uh, and this is work that we've kind of undertaken with uh, partners. This is uh, an example of some of the work that we've done with Shure Hammer at the University of Glasgow. He's from the Faroe Islands. And we actually looked at Arctic skua pellets. So the Arctic skuas are these top predators. 
and they eat these other seabirds. And when we looked at what those in their prey versus the amount of plastics, we found that they, you know, they eat a lot of puffins, but they don't have a lot of plastics in them. And and neither do the 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 when you look at the dyes of the skewers, the pellets of the skewers, they also don't. The same thing. There's a lot of black leg kittiwakes, but when the black leg kittiwakes are present, we don't see a lot of plastics. Whereas the opposite is true for fulmars. They don't eat them very often, so we don't we don't find a ton of them. But when they do have fulmar bits and pieces in their pellets, they have a ton of plastics. And so this is actually one of the first documented trophic transfers of plastic debris that we were able to report. And this is kind of work that's ongoing. We've done a, a review of, of this kind of work. It's, it was a trophic transfer of plastics. And, and it ended up, we wanted to ask questions around how often is trophic transfer of plastics being uh, addressed. And what it kind of ended up was just really a review of where plastic ingestion is being reported and how can we increase it better. And so these are, if you're not familiar with it, these are all the large marine ecosystems, the L LMEs, and then the offshore FAO fishing regions. Um, and we basically, you know, categorize all the plastic ingestion studies in each one of these, again, zones. Uh, and then we were able to kind of take a look at kind of how this, this kind of falls out. And you can see there are some areas that really glow or light up. So the Mediterranean, uh, you know, Newfoundland, Labrador really have a lot of a huge number of studies. The North Sea has, a, you know, a fair amount. The coast of Brazil has some. But there are some areas like these offshore areas as well as, you know, some several important coastal areas um, that have no reports to date. Uh, and then a big thing that we report is that there are very, very few freshwater areas studied to date. So only about five watersheds in the world have data. And so we often have this focus on marine plastics, but uh, it's really that freshwater that leads to all the oceans that is really understudied at this point. We've also started, um, we recently got a, a grant with my uh, partner, um, Heath McMillan at Carl's University. He's one of my research partners. And we also are starting to look at these uh, terrestrial invertebrates. And so we started by looking at, um, you know, glitter and how these species uptake them. And this is work that's just starting. We have three, well, we have two postdocs, sorry, one postdoc, Jane, and then Sarita and Marshall are both doing graduate work. And initial results show that while these animals kind of intake glitter, when you look at their poop and, and their stomachs, you kind of don't get glitter anymore, but you get dust. Um, and so we're really trying to understand how, you know, plastic kind of enter the, in, the terrestrial environment and how actually these very small critters, I often just think of them as bird food, um, really can change those, those plastics. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one a little bit. Um, I'm just going to go right to here. This is actually a recent study by um, Madeline Bordy. She just defended her master's uh, a couple months ago. And she's actually started to look in plastic poop. We wanted to see what they're pooping out. So we know what's going into birds, but we want to see what's coming on the other side. Um, and so she, we, we collected poop. She looked at it and we sifted it out. And we found, you know, in birds that they're, they are pooping out these different plastic and she looked at kind of the number of birds on the colonies and estimated how much microplastics is probably being deposited per year in the poop of the birds. And so we, you know, we have an estimate of millions, and this is an Arctic seabird colony where, you know, upwards of 45 million pieces per year. And so what's really interesting is these birds, fulmars, have more plastics, but they, you can see they, des um, they nest in less dense colonies. And so they're probably not depositing a ton to the year, ton to the environment. But full, or sorry, MERS, they also have plastics in their stomach, not as much, but some, but they are really highly, um, kind of have high densities. And so they're estimated to um, be pooping out 45 million pieces per year. And so this is work that we're, we're following up. On, and this is another student, Bonnie Hamilton, where she's looking in the different environments. And so she's actually looked in kind of the poop of the birds, the sediments around the colony, we've done atmospheric fallout, and then of course the surface waters. What she finds, and you can see this in the um, in the in the diagram, is that you know there are different kinds. There's a lot of fibers in these places, but then in the surface water, there's very different ones. Um, and I think what I'm going to do, and so I think that is something that we're kind of thinking about more, is how birds can think about plastic pollution. 
And I, I'm going to ask for your apologies. I'm going to go right to just a few um, short slides that I'm going to talk about. And so one of the other things that we're really trying to understand is contribute to um, the contaminants. And so it's not just about plastic, it's also about these plastic additives. And so we see these substituted antioxidants um, in, in livers and eggs. And so we thought kitty bakes would have lower levels of these plastic additives in their tissues versus fomars. So you can see from these, they're very, very similar and they're both present in the liver and the egg. And so while we don't see a species difference, um, it's really interesting to see that these are not only just staying, but they're getting deposited into their eggs as well. And this is part of a larger study that we did with birds and seals. Um, and so the point being is that, you know, we, we then were like, oh, seals, we hadn't looked in seals before, um, but we do find these UV stabilizers, these additives in seals. And so we actually then had a student look in a whole bunch of seals and these were collected by Inuit uh, hunters in the Arctic. And so we actually looked in 142 seal stomachs. Um, and we didn't actually find any plastics. And so just because you find plastic doesn't mean you will find plastic contaminants. And just because you find plastic contaminants in an animal doesn't mean you'll find plastics. And I think that's a really important kind of thing for us to think about. Um, I'm going to kind of maybe just end on this one is that one of the things that we have been thinking a lot about is this idea of how do you uh, weave together kind of Western-based science and then Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous science together. And this is how you kind of really shape and inform policy. And so this is where a lot of the work that we're kind of thinking about now is, is moving towards. Um, and I have a whole lecture on that that um, I, I won't dive into, but I think that this is a really important component of the work uh, you know, and I really appreciated the land acknowledgement in the opening statements. And I think one of the things that people often challenge us about is that Indigenous knowledge or Indigenous science is kind of um, can't exist because plastics is new. And I often challenge back that, you know, plastics is new to science or environmental science and plastics is new um, to people on the land. And actually, when we combine our, our information and our ways of knowing together, we actually get a much broader and bigger picture of the puzzle and we can come up with solutions together. And so I just maybe will land on that thought um, and stop there in case people have questions. And I know that was a fast and furious discussion, but hopefully, um, yeah, you have more, more answers than questions at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen, and thank you for um, dealing with all the technical issues today. We really appreciate it. So being mindful that it's 1.30, if anyone has a burning question, please put it in the chat right now and maybe we can get to one or two. Um, Rachel, who is no longer on the call, but I could email her your brief response after this, but she asked um, when you were showing the plastic bags, um, were the differences seen due to ocean currents? Yeah, so I, I tried to address that one as I was talking, but it's, it's really about the proximity to the ocean gyres. And so if you if you actually put up a map of where those plastic gyres are located, the Atlantic gyre is actually much closer to the continent versus the Pacific gyre, because the Pacific's so big, is actually much farther off the coast of the continent. And so when you're talking about, you know, fish, it could be very different, but when we're talking about migratory birds, at least the fulmar, which is, you know, a little bit less kind of in the middle of the ocean, um, you know, that's kind of really what it is. It's about, yeah, the proximity to the ocean gyres. Right. Great. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, so I think I'll close out that session if that's okay. There's a lot of thanks in, um, over there as well, so yes. Yeah echoing all of that, thank you. Um, a quick couple notes. If you need to run to class, that is perfectly okay. Feel free to. Um, I just want to let everyone know that there's a couple of exciting events coming up. So next week we have a panel discussion on One Health as a part of the Royal Agricultural Virtual Experience. Um, the panel discussion will be 4.45 p.m. ET on Wednesday, November 11th. The title of the panel is Plants and Animals and Humans. Oh my! What is One Health and what does it have to do with your future career? The four panelists are Drs. Deb Stark, Heather Murphy, Travis Steffens, and Samira Mubaraka. Um, each of them has followed a unique path and can provide some interesting insight into their developing One Health careers. 
And lastly, I want to remind everyone that we have our last One Health seminar of the fall semester on November 18th at 12.30 p.m. EP, so two weeks from now. And our speaker will be Dr. Graham Taylor from the School of Engineering here at the University of Guelph. The title of his presentation is How Experimental Psychology Can Help Explainable Artificial Intelligence. So thank you again, Dr. Provenche, and thank you for joining. We hope to see you again next week at the Rural Agricultural Virtual Experience or in two weeks for our final seminar of the fall semester. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.